couple minutes early. I always get told by my friends that I'm a few minutes late, so I have to assume that actually I'm uh, probably just right on time. Um, oh no, whoops. I have myself on in the background, which is another uncommon occurrence, um, in case you heard a, a slight echo there. Hopefully I've taken care of that. <clears throat> well, hi everyone. Welcome back to this week's Matt Opens Toys. Uh, I'm very excited about this week. Um, hello to my one viewer. Uh, I've been looking forward to this particular toy opening extravaganza. Extravaganza. Haha. <laughs> um, very excited for an excellent installment of this stream uh, because we're going to be delving into probably my favorite pop culture artifact or, I don't know, license series uh, thing. So today we're going to be looking at some Marvel Legends. I'm a big Marvel head in general, but um, I would say my favorite comic book characters, some of my favorite fictional characters in general, happen to be the X-Men. Big fan of X-Men. Um, always have been, I would say, probably pretty much my entire life. Definitely kicked into high gear when the 90s X-Men animated program uh, debuted. I was still pretty young. I don't remember exactly. I was maybe probably around like six or so when that started coming out, because I think it was 92. Um, I remember going to Pizza Hut when they had like the Pizza Hut X-Men promotions and they gave you like some special mini comics, um, just everything X-Men. Always been real big into X-Men. Um, and I think, you know, I've talked a little bit about my level of excitement for opening different things. And um, there's some cool toys and I still have a lot of cool toys to open, but I think some of the other franchises that I've touched upon with some of the streams that I've had so far, um, they're just not ones that I have quite as much affection for. I would say if I could only collect stuff related to one franchise, it would probably be X-Men. And fortunately, that's not the case. So I collect a lot of stuff. Um, but uh, X-Men holds a very special place in my heart. Uh, so you'll see we have some additions to our desk friends. Let me... Uh, let me introduce our new additions. I consider this stream the uh, the stream on the eve of Easter. Um, I think Easter is this Sunday. I think. I'm pretty sure. I think it's like East, uh, April 4th. April, my favorite month, um, because it's my birthday month. It was my grandfather's birthday month as well. Um, so I'm always very hyped for April in general. Um, this is one of our... Easter editions for our desk friends. This is, uh, I believe, actually like a little Easter trinket Lego that came out. Um, I have a couple of additional rabbit-themed um, Lego friends. She has a gun because she's a Batman villain. But, you know, if you just wanted to be a rabbit with a gun, who am I to say anything about that? We also have these uh, packs of Roger Rabbit uh, trading cards that Liz got online for, I'm sure, a steal and a deal. Um, because Liz, I, I think I mentioned on one of the recent streams, um, we've seen Vinny opening trading cards and... You know, it doesn't take it doesn't take a whole lot of push to get us to try some additional um, collectible stuff. So those Roger Rabbit cards were something that Liz thought was neat. I thought was neat. They were cheap. Uh, so yeah, we made the magic happen. All right, desk friends, hello. So like I said, this week we're going to be jumping into looking at uh, some X Men related toys and. Uh, I'm just gonna set them all out first so we can get a look at the entire wave. Um, these are 
Marvel Legends, X-Men, House of X, the Build-A-Figure for this wave is the Tri-Sentinel. So all of the looks, all of the costumes that they have, even the art here, um, are all referencing specifically the latest in uh, eras, I guess, for the X-Men. Uh, within the last two years, Jonathan Hickman, a writer that I, that I pretty much like. I like what Jonathan Hickman does. Um, my lovely wife is not joining me. She just needed a cup of water and probably didn't want to be remarked upon. Too bad. Um, anyway, like I was saying, so all of the appearances and the Build-A-Figure for this wave are all referencing Jonathan Hickman's new uh, run on the main X-Men line. He came in for a big overhaul of the X-Men um, for a while in the comics and also with regards to like the toys and merchandising, the X-Men were kind of in a weird limbo position because um, Fox had held the rights, the movie rights for X-Men. And, uh, you know, Disney had acquired Marvel, but for a few years there, it was before Disney had also acquired Fox. So the X-Men were kind of a property that they kind of were letting kind of sit in sort of stasis, so to speak. Definitely from a merchandising standpoint, but also in a way, I mean, I guess, eh, you know, it was in kind of a doldrum as far as the creative uh, era for the comics. This is Professor Xavier himself, Charles Xavier. Strange look. I'll talk about it a little bit more when we look at all of the... Um, all of the toys individually. But yeah, so there's a new author. Um, <clears throat> there was a while where Disney owned Marvel, but they didn't own the movie rights for X-Men. And so they were kind of, you know, letting the movies do whatever. I mean, Fox was still coming out with X-Men movies. And so Disney was kind of not really doing much with them. You know, some people claim that there was like an out and out, like blackout with regards to the toys for a while, um, that they were discouraging Hasbro from manufacturing X-Men related toys. I would imagine that it's maybe more of a combination of there was just a lot of other properties that Disney had stuff coming out for and was probably more enthused to have Hasbro produce material for that kind of stuff. And it probably impacted the availability of X-Men, but it's, you know, they can only put out so many toys a year. So they're going to do more or less what Disney tells them that they should be focusing on. And, you know, maybe there was a little bit of not um, making X-Men toys for a while. I mean, there was definitely a big drought um, as far as X-Men related toys for a few years there. And as a matter of fact, I mean, in that period of time is probably when I started to collect um, maybe more general Marvel Legends, I would say maybe of properties that I aren't as attached to, that I'm not as attached to, as X-Men themselves. Um, so they tricked me. They got me good. I mean, they did get me to buy more than one Captain America and Iron Man figure, and there was probably a point in my life where I would have been pretty unenthused to do so, um, at least by comparison to my enthusiasm for just getting any and all X-Men merchandise. Um, like I said, X-Men, it's been a lifelong thing for me. Um, back from the animated series, I had a ton of the Toy Biz toys. Um, loved Wolverine. Uh, Wolverine is probably still my favorite character. I know that he's maybe not the most interesting character for some people. Uh, I think that his heyday was as more of a supporting character in the uh, Claremont run. Um, the much storied Claremont run. Because he's cool when he gets to be like mysterious and stuff, but I just love Wolverine in general. Everything that he does um, is all right with me. So this is the entire wave. This is a seven figure wave. Um, one of the nice things that I like with this is that they actually got the artist from, I believe it's the artist, from the opening comic arc basically they kicked off this new era of x-men 
with a, uh, was it, I think it was in total, it was 12 parts, but it was six issues of House of X, and then there was six issues of, I believe it's Powers of X, but I, I have people tell me sometimes that it's Powers of 10. Um, but House of X, Powers of X, um, were kind of like an introduction to this new era of X-Men, which is a very interesting era overall, as far as like the overall publication history. I think they made some um, some strong choices that, you know, maybe longtime X-Men fans don't really love some of the character choices. Mostly, I would say, as it pertains to good old Professor X and uh, Magneto, all of which was kind of spurred on by Moira McTaggart. Um, it it kind of has some interesting effects for the status quo as far as the comics were to go. Uh, it really opens them up to really kind of tell whatever kind of stories they might want to. Uh, maybe with the exception of just kind of telling more of your conventional like Xavier Institute, like this is a school kind of story. That seems to have kind of dropped by the, um, by the sidelines for the most part because the current status quo, oh man, it, it would be a lot to explain. So, and I know it was also in the middle of just kind of talking about how Disney didn't have these guys for a while. Maybe I'll backtrack and not try to explain this comic so much, but also explain kind of why this is sort of a, a renaissance period, I guess, for the X-Men in the comics. Um, so again, there was a while where Disney owned Marvel, but Fox owned the X-Men movie rights, so they really weren't doing much. They weren't paying special attention in the way that they were paying special attention to the things that they had movie rights to. Um, but eventually, towards the end of that era, when it kind of looked like there was going to be a Fox deal coming, um, after a long period of time where Hasbro hadn't really produced any Marvel Legends of X-Men, uh, they came back, and in my opinion, they came back really strong, uh, when they did a Juggernaut Build-A-Figure wave that had a brown costume Wolverine. Um, just a lot of, like, fan-favorite characters. They had uh, Rogue in her Jim Lee costume. Um, a lot of things that people, I think, were kind of excited for. The, you know, this was right when they started to slowly start wave, wave over wave of toys to start to bring in those Jim Lee designs, which was something that a lot of people were excited to like complete an entire team of the Jim Lee designs. Um, <clears throat> but they slowly started to release X-Men figures again. I've been picking them up fairly religiously um, as far as the X-Men themed waves. Uh, I've gotten a little bit more selective about some of the non-X-Men Marvel legend waves that are coming out. Um, but if an X-Men wave comes out, usually it's going to have a good number of things that are going to appeal to me. They've done a lot of X-Men waves recently. Normally they tend to have about like two a year. They've done some pretty specialized ones, like they did Age of Apocalypse, um, which is kind of a al alternate reality from the 90s X-Men wave. Like it was very popular at the time, but I don't know that it's had like a ton of longevity aside from... You know, people liked the character designs of it. Um, a lot of them were designed by this artist, Joe Moderaria. Um, I hope I pronounced that name correctly. I probably didn't, but um, yeah. So, I mean, they've been in a better position. Um, Disney finally worked out the rights to buy back the movie rights of X-Men. And then now, coinciding with them having the movie rights back, they also had basically the guy that revitalized the Avengers line that writer Jonathan Hickman come in and just kind of give him more or less editorial control over the entire X-Men line of comics. So they've been doing a lot of interesting stuff with the comics themselves. Um, Jonathan Hickman is a pretty interesting writer. Uh, he has a lot of interesting ideas and I think a lot of the things that they're doing with the X-Men lineup right now are just really cool. Hello second viewer. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll talk a little bit about the current uh, imprint of X-Men comics as we get into opening these guys up. I'm going to move some of these 
other guys out of the way so we can start with the opening proper. Um, I would have done this probably last week when we did the uh, Transformers stream, except I didn't have my Professor Xavier. I had pre-ordered all of these guys back when they were first announced uh, from Hasbro Pulse. Um, shout out Hasbro Pulse. Um, Hasbro, please feel free to get in the contact with me. I would love for you to be a sponsor. That'd be great. Um, but I pre-ordered them back when they were announced, which was, I guess, around Christmas time last year. I was pleasantly surprised that they were going to be doing toys based off of these designs because they're still pretty new as far as uh, the comic imprint. I know that House of X, Powers of Ten, I think it started maybe about a year and a half ago. It might be coming up on two years that they've been doing this particular um, comic series. But yeah, I think this is one of the faster turnarounds of them doing comic book designs, like new costume designs in toy form. Normally it takes a little while because uh, I'm sure there's a lot of like planning that has to go into this. Um, <clears throat> as we open these guys up, we're going to see a lot of these figures which is something that's pretty much always true of Marvel Legends. They have kind of a stock catalog of what, what are called bucks. Um, a buck is pretty much like the base design of the body. Um, so they tend to have like a little library of bucks that they are using frequently. Um, and that allows them typically to kind of make these a little bit less expensive. Um, you know, this is not a high-end collector's line, Marvel Legends, generally speaking. Um, these guys are usually priced around like 20 bucks. And one of the ways that they keep the cost down, relatively speaking, is because they do have a lot of like piece reusage. Um, I like the art that they included for these. They have, um, as well, the names of the characters are on the front in a typeface from the comics. This is called Krakoan, because right now the X-Men, all of them, live on this island of Krakoa, which is you know, from the comics in like the 80s, um, when a lot of the famous international X-Men were introduced, they uh, were rescuing the original team from an island called Krakoa. It's returned in the comics and become basically like the setting of where things happen, um, more or less. There's a lot of whys to that, but yeah, anyway. I might discuss it, I might not. Like I said, it's really, there's a lot to it. There's a lot to it. Jonathan Hickman, the current, uh, basically X-Men, head of X-Men over at Marvel, he's a big ideas kind of guy. Um, does a lot of like exploring things conceptually, um, brings in kind of wild, out of left field sort of things. Um, one of the things about his comics, like I like his comics overall. I really enjoyed his run on the Avengers leading all the way up to uh, Secret Wars and all that stuff. Um, but none of the characters, even the ones that you would expect to be pretty chatty, none of them really seem to talk too, too much. I don't think Hickman's a big talker guy. Um, the pacing that he does on his comics is pretty interesting because they tend to be yeah, relatively action packed, but they, they kind of seem incidental at first. So, um, this is Wolverine from House of X. Like I said, Wolverine, one of my favorite characters. I have a ton of Wolverine toys. Um, really absurd amount of Wolverine toys. Um, and this one is pretty nice. Uh, again, this is his current costume, or it was the costume that he basically started that run of um, House of X, Powers of Ten, uh, off with. It's sort of a uh, an update of his classic uh, brown and tan costume, which uh, came out in the 80s. It was like his second Claremont costume. Um, this uses a standard Wolverine buck. So basically this body design uh, came out basically right when they f were getting back into doing X-Men uh, action figures again, which now has been a little bit of a while ago because that Juggernaut Wave Wolverine has pretty much the exact same um, base body that you see here. Uh, I know that this is all about opening toys, but I actually have that other Wolverine, so I can give you kind of a little point of comparison, if you'll bear with me for one second. Um, 
All right. So just to give you a little side by side, you can see here, if you look closely, these two actually use the same basic body. So the engineering, the articulation, all of that base stuff is the same. The things that are going to be different in the way that they've uh, <clears throat> kind of constructed this figure, again, to make him a little bit more accurate to his current look in the comics, is uh, he has a different boot type than what you see there. His gloves, too, are a little bit more textured. They do a lot of, like, adding just general tactical looking lines on costumes nowadays in comparison to the original brown and tan costume as well this one his uh his little fin mask things are actually the same color brown as the rest of the costume normally those are black on most other versions of wolverine's costume so um <clears throat> again this is accurate to his look in that opening arc of the new jonathan hickman run the House of X, Powers of X run. He comes with an alternate portrait. Um, so this is his default head, which is kind of interesting. Um, they have him just kind of giving a big kind of goofy grin. Um, not maybe what you would think of when you think Wolverine, um, but there's been a lot of Wolverines. Normally in an X-Men wave, they'll try and squeeze in at least one Wolverine. Uh, he's a very popular character in addition to being my favorite character. What can I say? I guess I have somewhat conventional tastes in some ways. Um, but there's been so many Wolverine toys that, you know, I can kind of forgive them giving him uh, this kind of unusual expression for Wolverine, uh, just because you've had so many different versions of uh, Wolverine come out that, you know, if you give him a big cheesy grin, on one out of the 40 Wolverines that you're gonna put out. I mean, it's not the end of the world. Um, there's an alternative uh, portrait that he comes with that's again a reference to the uh, opening comic arc. Um, you can see there maybe a little bit more of a standard Wolverine expression that you might expect, just looking a little annoyed in general. Uh, but he's got this little gray beard. Um, again, that's a direct reference to the comic because in Powers of 10, or Powers of X, whatever, I'm just gonna say Powers of X, I think. I'm, I'm gonna mix it up and probably use both interchangeably throughout the stream, so, you know, just, just get used to it. Um, but there's a scene of some X-Men in the far future, uh, and amongst those X-Men in the far future is a older, more grizzled Wolverine, which is a thing, like, even just for his own character, like, they did that in Days of Future Past, um, there was a Wolverine running around the Marvel Universe for a while called Old Man Logan, which was just a, um, an old version of Wolverine from an alternate reality where he had, you know, accidentally murdered all his friends, whoops, you know, that happens, um, but this is the latest in a proud tradition of uh, older Wolverines. I kind of like the expression a little bit better on this. Like I said, I don't hate the cheesy grin, but I think the, uh, you know, this is a costume and look and portrait that is very unique to this current arc of X-Men. And since I have so many other Wolverines on display, I might go ahead and just let this Wolverine live as that um, particular version. <clears throat> I've heard some speculation that some of those other future X-Men designs may be coming out in an upcoming X-Men wave, so he'll pair nicely if they do make some of those uh, future X-Men designs. There's some pretty cool ones. There's this uh, character that's basically like a genetic clone descendant of Colossus and Nightcrawler and X-23, and she just has a really cool looking design. I believe they called her Rasputin. Um, so a trademark of Marvel Legends, though, is that they come with a Build-A-Figure. You'll notice that that Wolverine was uh, a pretty plain release. He has the alternate head, but aside from the alternate head, he didn't come with anything else. Um, Chuck here, Professor X, in his new, very menacing outfit, um, you'll see he comes with that weird 
extra bit that doesn't seem to interact with him in any sort of meaningful way. Well, that's a part of our build a figure for this wave, uh, which is again, the Tri-Sentinel. Uh, we talked a little bit about, or I mentioned those future X-Men. Um, in that future scene, they show a version of a futuristic Sentinel, um, the Tri-Sentinel. That is the build a figure for this wave. I'm not sure exactly how it scales. Um, I haven't looked too much at like reviews of this wave or anything like that. This is a fairly recent wave. Um, I got mine basically last week with the exception of Professor Xavier who I got this week. Um, but they're just now starting to show up at like your Targets, your Walmarts, things like that. So if you're looking for them, they're pretty readily available, I think, right now. I also think that you can go on the Hasbro website and get them there, too. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool looking. Um, this is a very different look for Professor Xavier. Um, I assume that it probably has something to do with the story overall in the future um, that they're leading up to, but he looks kind of menacing, kind of mysterious. I mean, he obscures his face. Some of that, there is, like, story reasons as far as why he's doing that. Basically, he wears uh, Cerebro 24-7 now because there's a, uh, <clears throat> a mechanism that the mutants have uh, kind of constructed with their powers uh, where they have what they're calling, like, I think officially it's called the Resurrection Protocols. But basically, it's made it where... If, a, uh, <clears throat> if any of the mutants get killed, Professor X has a backup of their consciousness and their memories that he's storing in Cerebro and in his brain that allows them to basically recreate a body and place, place that person's memories and consciousness and whatnot back into it. I guess it gets into kind of that question of like, well, is this... Is this actually that person? Is it just a convincing copy of it? You know, those are the kind of, I guess, themes more or less that they're starting to explore in this, uh, in this particular arc of X-Men. But that's why, ostensibly, that's why Professor X is dressed in this kind of weird, menacing, like evil, honestly, looking getup. Um, uh, this is a reuse of a buck as well. Uh, interesting enough, this is actually like, this was originally a Spider-Man body that they've repurposed and used. Um, I mean, Professor Xavier isn't meant to be super athletic or anything like that. He's just kind of a slim guy overall. So I can see why they used a thinner uh, like body style on him, but he's still like, look how ripped he is. Professor X, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, maybe he is. Maybe he would be that ripped. Seems like an odd choice. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting look. I mean, it's very striking. Um, some of the designs of the current era of X-Men, I, I can't say they're like my favorite looks for those characters necessarily, but I can say that they're all, generally speaking, like pretty striking um, designs overall. But this one, I would say, is maybe one of the weirder ones. Um, Here's that arm for the Tri-Sentinel. We'll set that over to the side for right now. Um, this Professor Xavier comes with alternate hands, a pointing hand, and then a little, like, so that he can place his fingers on his temple in a I'm concentrating type way. It's kind of hard to get, get it to focus because it's pretty small. Um, and then you got your standard pointer. So I guess he can, yeah, give you some direction. Um, besides the alternate hands, he also comes with uh, an alternate portrait. Um, this is a little bit more like retro classic uh, Professor Xavier. Um, you can see, of course, he's not wearing the spooky menacing helmet. Um, sometimes Hasbro will do this thing with their toys where it kind of seems like some of the accessories that they throw in with newer releases are kind of meant to be used with some of their older ones. Uh, like some of their previous releases of a character to give them a little bit more of an iconic look. Um, like I said, 
<clears throat> nowadays in the comics, Professor X basically will always leave the Cerebro helmet on, so I don't think there's really been a ton of scenes recently of him with the helmet off or displaying like the classic like 60s style, like this is this is how we represent his psychic powers kind of thing. Um, there is a old older style Professor X that came out with a, uh, a large gold floating hover chair. Um, this would go very well on that. I do have that um, particular Professor Xavier. I might swap out the heads. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a nice little addition. I don't think that it's um, particularly relevant to this version of Xavier, but it's nice that they included it again, even if it's just kind of like, like I said, it feels like sometimes they just give you a little bonus if you bought that previous version of the character. I don't know if that's exactly their design intention, but moving right along. Like I said, there's seven figures in this wave, um, six of which with Build-A-Figure pieces. Now this one is Omega Sentinel. Um, a little bit different than like a conventional Sentinel. I'm sure most of you know what a regular Sentinel looks like. They kind of have like those big blocky bodies and the little purple helmets and whatnot. Um, I don't really, I'm not as familiar with this character. Like I don't know a lot of her uh, in canon biography or anything like that. Uh, I think that she's kind of a, uh, a somewhat popular character. Um, she was brought back to be used as an antagonist in this current wave uh, or current run of X-Men. But I think she was maybe introduced uh, within the past 10 years or so. There's a, another writer named Brian Wood. I want to say maybe Brian Wood helped to develop Omega Sentinel. Um, she has a name, like a more regular human sounding name, like Karina or something like that. I honestly, like I said, I'm not super familiar with the character. There's a lot of eras of X-Men that I'm familiar with. I read a lot of the Grant Morrison X-Men run. Um, in the past few years, I had gone back and uh, started to read the Claremont run, and uh, it, it holds up. I mean, it's, it's pretty good. This big piece is just the uh, torso, center torso part of that Tri-Sentinel, um, so we can start building this as we uh, get his various pieces out. Um, but Omega Sentinel, I talked a little bit about how Hasbro will save costs a little bit by reusing bucks uh, or the basic body designs. This appears to be a fully unique sculpt. So this was probably one of the more expensive um, to design and manufacture in the wave. So for those people that are big fans of this character, I mean, that's, that's got to be a nice thing because she gets a fully unique sculpt. Uh, there would be, I mean, in other releases, they may just, you know, paint and use an existing buck, but they actually gave her a lot of sculpted details. Um, like Professor Xavier, theoretically, there's uh, additional costume details that could be sculpted in, um, but they just used that basic Spider-Man body and colored it because I guess they felt the details on that costume wasn't as important to get across, but with her, um, even though some of the design elements are pretty subtle, like pretty hard to notice, even like some of the sculpt right there at the top of her chest and, um, all of that. I mean, this is a fully unique sculpt. So that's a, it's a pretty nice figure. Again, I mean, I, I could probably do well to get a little bit more familiar with this character. Um, but a nice figure, um, a nice unique sculpt. She comes with a lot of extras. I mean, like I said, I, I'm pretty sure she must be the most expensive one uh, that they had as far as like development, um, simply because of <clears throat> the amount of unique tooling and sculpting that she would have needed. And in addition to just already being a figure with a completely unique sculpt, they also gave her two, 
two unique heads. Um, this, I believe, is uh, kind of her appearance, closer to her appearance when the character like first made her debut. Um, again, I'm not terribly familiar with the character, so I'm afraid I can't give you a lot of specifics as far as who she is or whatnot, but um, you have a couple different options of how you might want to display her. This head, though, is pretty heavy because of this big hair piece, so you, she gets a little bit trickier to balance um, as a result of that big hair. Oh my goodness. Maybe, oh, there we go. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of your trade-off. A lot of times with those female characters, if they do have, like, famously large hair or, like, flowing hair, yeah, she's a little weird um, as far as the alternate head. Um, she also comes with two alternate hand or arms, basically. So you can see she has, like, the robot arms. I'm going to swap her head just so that she's easy to stand up again. So you can actually remove the lower portion of her arms and swap them out with these little like cannon bits. This is something that again, because she's kind of like a robot cyborg character. This is uh, this is something accurate to what the character actually has available to her in the power set. So you can see, not only did she come with one of the bigger pieces of the build a figure, but she actually came with a pretty fair amount of accessories for herself. I mean, a really, uh, really fully realized figure, I would say. And again, for people that are like a big fan of that character in particular, I would think that they must feel pretty satisfied with that. <clears throat> um, I think that, I think that I've seen people complain that maybe the heads and faces aren't quite the exact right colors for the character. Again, I'm not as familiar with her, so... I can't speak to that, but uh, overall, I'd say she's pretty impressive. Um, with the Wolverine feeling like pretty standard and that Professor Xavier being mostly a Spider-Man body, um, you know, she's, she's kind of the production value. I think um, even though she's not a character that I'm very familiar with, I think she's a very nice toy. Um, <clears throat> so this particular lineup included... Wolverine, Professor Xavier, the Omega Sentinel. Um, they refer to her as Marvel Girl, but this is going to be Jean Grey that I'm opening up next. Uh, Moira McTaggart, Magneto, and Cyclops. So those are all like pretty big names in X-Men overall. This is uh, Marvel Girl, Jean Grey. This is kind of her old throwback 60s costume. Not her original, original costume, but I think it's like the first costume that she moved to after the um, after her very, very first costume. Uh, so she has a real retro look, but that is accurate to the comics. Um, they've had her, for whatever reason, in this current run of X-Men, um, everybody's just kind of been... <laughs> yeah, it does kind of look like Peter Pan, definitely from like a color perspective. Um, but in this current run of comics, they've kind of made it where every X-Men character kind of goes back and will just use some of their old retro costumes from previous eras. Um, that's one of the things that I think is kind of neat about this, uh, this current era of X-Men comics is that they, they've basically, because of the resurrection thing, they've made it where every character from the history of X-Men has a chance of showing up. And then for those characters that are kind of mainstay characters, um, they're letting them kind of go back and use costumes that they haven't used in years. Um, so even though, again, this isn't like, this is by no means a favorite look of mine for Jean Grey, um, I think it's neat that you're getting kind of a nice high quality version of this um, particular costume. Uh, I don't know if that means that maybe they're going to go back and start giving some more retro costume options for some of the other characters. Um, this is interesting. Uh, so this appears to be kind of a new way that they're sculpting the female torso because normally there would be some kind of like ball joint or hinge here. Um, but they've just done like a kind of like a, 
a different approach to the actual waste. So you're getting a lot of the option for movement without it really disrupting the sculpt. Um, kind of cool uh, as far as just some of the little improvements that maybe they've made in engineering. They did do a little bit of like cost cutting here because she has like sculpted high heel shoes, but they just painted it to be her go-go boot kind of stuff. Um, she's got a nice, I like the portrait, the sculpt. It doesn't look a thing though, like any of the previous Jean Grays that they've released, which is interesting because sometimes they're pretty consistent in the way that they portray characters. Like when they get, when they get a certain portrait, the other ones like additional versions of that character will tend to kind of at least look similar or like they might be the same person. Um, it's also a different color red than they've been giving Jean lately. She comes with some alternative hand pieces and she comes with a little um, Krakoa blossom. This is something again from the current run of comics. Um, basically they plant these little flowers and it lets them grow a gate wherever they are that allows them to travel quickly back to Krakoa, their home base. Uh, I can't, I can't very easily tell if this is supposed to be the left or the right leg. I guess the purple lines up with it being the left leg, so. Looking pretty tall so far. Uh, but yeah, like I said, some pretty big names in X-Men, some unconventional looks. I mean, these are all pretty famous characters. Uh, this is a character coming up that is <clears throat> pretty important narratively, even though she's only appeared kind of in that weird kind of prologue comic that they put out. Uh, and she's definitely never had a action figure before. Uh, this is Moira McTaggart. I think she's uh, famously the mother of uh, Proteus, maybe? She's, uh, she's some character's mom. And I think she's some character's mom with, uh, with Professor Xavier, if I recall correctly. I'm a little hazy on some of the details of, of some of her character biography. Um, they also kind of revitalized her character entirely with this new era of, uh, <clears throat> of X-Men because they revealed that she, I think conventionally she's been portrayed as a, uh, as just a human, a human scientist, a geneticist, which is why, which is why she knew Professor Xavier and why she was able to have a relationship, um, with him and whatnot. So there's two versions of Moira that you can have with this action figure, which is kind of neat. You have like the uh, the scientist version in the lab coat. But this one, which is something that they don't tend to do with many of their figures, um, she actually has a full alternative pair of arms that allows you to create essentially a completely different look for the character. Um, so you have by default with the lab coat kind of her more classic conventional look of her as just like the scientist. Um, but you can remove the arms or I'll try to. <laughs> They're in there, they're firm. But you can remove her arms, which allows you to remove the jacket, and then you can pop in these alternative arms for a jacketless look. Again, this is not something that Mar or that Hasbro does terribly often. I think, uh, I think this might be the first. This is the first one that I can think of. Uh, as it pertains to Marvel Legends. She's got a sticky joint there, so I'll probably need to heat that up before I try and twist it because otherwise run the risk of damaging that joint. 
Um, this happens sometimes. Again, these are not super high-end figures, so they sometimes have little quality control issues that you wouldn't expect out of uh, maybe more expensive uh, toys. We can give her a little scarf, and then she has her jaunty little hat. So you've got like more retro looking Moira that you can swap her hat into. Um, kind of a neat concept, I guess. Um, you get, again, the classic Moira, which uh, suits people looking to put together that kind of more classic collection. But this is, even though this is a very retro look for the character, this is uh, an appearance that basically made its debut in the more recent run of comics. I think, since the arms are so sticky at the elbow joint, I might just keep her as the scientist for now um, until I can make sure that those arms are going to behave. Um, this is another character that comes with a pretty decent amount of accessories considering the completely alternative appearance that she has, and then she comes with this little journal. So yeah, like I was saying, they typically have portrayed her as just like a geneticist, um, human scientist, but uh, I guess spoilers for the comics. In this more recent run, they basically revealed that she does have a mutant power, but it's sort of an unconventional mutant power in that um, when she dies, she gets reborn with the same memories, and basically it kind of like, it's a restart of the timeline. So that's one of the big plot reveals in that early prologue thing that they had for her. <clears throat> uh, and basically this is like, I think this might be like the 10th time. And they also give an indication that it's a mutant power that isn't just like infinite. There's gonna be a point where you know, she will no longer be able to be reborn into a new life or whatnot. Um, pretty high concept. Again, like I said at the beginning, Jonathan Hickman, the current head of uh, X-Men for Marvel, is a very big ideas kind of guy. And uh, Moira factors into that. So she was in kind of that prologue and she hasn't really appeared since. Uh, I imagine she probably won't again for a while since that whole thing about her being reborn and whatnot is kind of a secret in the comics right now, at least for the other X-Men characters. All right. Um, next up in this line, we have Magneto. Uh, it's a cool new Magneto look. I would say, though... Yeah, um... This is basically a, a reuse of a prior Magneto release that they had. Um, that looks to be basically a one-to-one -one reuse of most of the pieces that they used in a three-pack that was released through Amazon recently. That was Scarlet Witch, Quicksilver, and Magneto. It's always tricky when they put these cape characters in. Ah, there we go. So nice, big, sculpted, iconic cape. Uh, this is kind of your classic Magneto costume, except in white. Um, he's more or less one of the like leaders of the current group of X-Men on Krakoa, or leaders, I guess, of more of, more so like the mutant community, because that's kind of kind of more what they're getting at than specifically a team of X-Men. Um, so he's got, I think, this white and silver to be kind of a, uh, it's like a redemptive look for him. He's like found peace and whatnot. His people are thriving, his crops, are thriving. Um, everything's good. Yeah, white's a little bland. It's not my favorite look for him. I mean, you kind of can't beat the classic purple and red. It's, uh, you know, menacing. Uh, there are some parts of this that aren't a reuse. So these like um, gauntlet pieces. And then it looks like these are actually different 
feet than the last Magneto release. Um, no sculpted boots. I don't know if he has boots um, in the comics, but he's pretty like back heavy because of that cape. So he has to kind of stand in a weird pose. He comes with a lot of alternatives. The only thing that I don't like is I kind of, I feel like his face looks a little squished. Um, presumably because they had to sculpt for it to be visible through the narrow cracks of that uh, helmet. He comes with the three heads of the Tri-Sentinel. And he comes with a few alternate pairs of hands. We've talked about hands on here before. As a matter of fact, in the debut stream, we talked about hands. But there's just... They give you so many hands with toys now. Or at least, like, quote-unquote, adult-oriented toys. Just all these hands. So many hands. Like, it's, it's nice for posing, but I don't know. It just seems... It seems a little ridiculous, too, at the same time. So these guys... These little, like, snaky-looking dudes uh, are the heads for the Tri-Sentinel. So we can pop those in. And then we're, we're, almost, uh, we're almost done with this particular set of toys. Ugh. The joints on these are kind of interesting because they seem like they would be good for posing, but it actually, it's kind of tricky. And also, the little stems that the heads go on are kind of narrow, so it's kind of tricky getting these heads on, is what I'm saying. Even though they look like they would <clears throat> behave pretty well. Well, I got two of them in. Let me see if I can get this third. Ugh. It's kind of tricky. Okay. Well, I may need to come back to that. It's just on such a thin little stem. You got to make this tiny little stem thing go into this. It's actually pretty tough. Ugh. Yeah, that's not happening right this second. Okay, well, let's open our last guy from this wave. Cyclops. Um, so this Cyclops costume <clears throat> is how he appears in the current comics. It's kind of a, a reference to the Bendis era, which basically was more or less the same costume except with red detailing instead of the blue. And also he, instead of his traditional visor, at that time his powers were a little jacked up. And so he actually just had like a red X that went across his face. Um, but... That Bendis costume in recent years, I would say, has kind of become the default Cyclops costume because it's a pretty solid design. I think the original costume design was by Chris uh, Bacciallo, a great um, X-Men artist. He had a little sense of how that costume looks here. All right. um, now, this Cyclops is... Pretty much a 100% part reuse, um, as most Cyclops toys that they release tend to be. Um, these tend to be kind of, I think, looked, looked upon negatively um, for the most part, especially the particular buck that they're reusing or reusing in the case of most of the Cyclops toys that come out. Um, because this 
this body, this torso, all of this, basically since Hasbro brought back Marvel Legends, they've had this particular body in circulation as kind of the default uh, male body. Uh, it came out originally with a, uh, I believe, with the Bucky Captain America. Um, and that's a number of years now. I would say it's been in use definitely over 10 years. Um, so you get things like mold degradation where sometimes parts of the sculpt, they really aren't as, um, as crisp as they were when it first came out. And then just in comparison to some of the other newer bodies that they've designed since then, it's a little bit uh, antiquated in terms of the way that they engineered the joints. Your favorite is Cyclops? I had no idea. I mean, he's a very practical guy. Um, so, I mean, I, I guess I can see it. I, I've come around on Cyclops quite a bit. Um, they've done a lot of interesting stuff with this character. And I think I also just, as uh, as I get older, I appreciate certain things about his character and the reliability that he has. Um, these gauntlets are probably the only new piece in the sculpt. Um, the head has been... Oh, your favorite of these figures? Oh, just from, like, appearance? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a nice design. It's pretty sleek. Um, he comes with, I would say, a slightly more... Uh, exciting alternative head because he has where he's firing off an optic blast comes with an optic blast effect so you can actually plug that in so if you wanted to swap out the head from his standard stoic expression you can have him firing off his lasers makes for a potentially dynamic uh, figure um, this one too, again, I mean, these are actually, this is still just a 100% part reuse because they've actually released a Cyclops toy with, uh, with that same part effect, um, somewhat recently. Um, uh, but overall, I mean, pretty nice, a good representation of the character, um, nice action effect as well. There's been some nice uh, Cyclops toys that have come out recently. Um, Mafex, or yeah. Was it Mafex? Yeah. Mafex came out with one of the uh, 90s Jim Lee costume, which is uh, still, for many pe people, the most iconic Cyclops appearance. Um, and that's a pretty nice figure. Um, so, I mean, you got, you got a lot of good choices for Cyclops if you're a Cyclops fan nowadays. And that's the last piece of the Tri-Sentinel. If I can get this head in, then we can have him fully assembled. Let me give it one more shot. Oh my goodness. Kind of just feels like that hole that the joint's supposed to pop into is maybe a little too shallow. Oh, there we go. I got him. I got him, folks. Don't worry. All right. Oh, great. Popped out. <laughs> Spoke too soon. Spoke too soon. Oh, man. Well, let me see. There we go. It's in there. Good enough. It is a, it is a pretty shallow joint, so it doesn't, doesn't sit in there super deep. Um, but we have now our fully assembled Tri-Sentinel. So Marvel Legends, for a long, long time, has had a gimmick of including with all of the figures a piece of it, usually a larger figure, though sometimes in recent years they've not always been a larger figure. Um, but they'll include a piece of basically a additional figure in the wave that you can only build if you were to buy the entire wave of toys. Uh, some people like the practice, some people don't like the practice. Um, a lot of a lot of American toy companies have started to emulate that same approach. Um, Mattel was doing it with their DC line. 
And then now that McFarlane has the uh, Mattel license, McFarlane's actually gotten into the Build-A-Figure uh, business as well. Uh, he could use a little bit more forward bend on this foot joint because he's a... Uh, he kind of wants to be crouching to to really stand well. You gotta distribute the weight evenly and he's a, he's a pretty unevenly distributed figure in terms of weight, so you really gotta kind of work with him to pose. Um, yeah, you can see if he was standing up straight, he's got about, really only about like an inch and a half, maybe two inches on most of the other guys. Um, but yeah, a lot of times they'll use the Build-A-Figures. Yeah, very top-heavy. A little bit too top-heavy, really. A lot of times they'll use the Build-A-Figures to basically put out a figure that would be too cost-prohibitive to really release as part of a regular wave. Like, this couldn't have just been uh, one of the regular toys in this wave because it would have just been... A little bit too expensive, I think, overall. They have started doing a little bit more of, like, deluxe figures. There's a, a, a MODOK that's coming out. They've been doing a couple... I actually have a couple additional Marvel Legends that, theoretically, I could be opening uh, on this stream as well. But I feel pretty good about leaving this as just uh, an X-Men stream. I'm coming up on my hour of talking, which is... A lot for me. This is an example of one of their deluxe releases. Uh, I'll open him sometime in the future, but uh, you can see he's a little bit bigger than most of these other guys. So when they when they're larger like that or take more materials, um, they've been releasing now stuff that's basically just at a little bit of a higher price point than the regular wave of figures. Um, but it, it, it kind of lets them release these, these sort of figures without necessarily making them a Build-A-Figure. Um, yeah, there's a couple characters that they've done that with recently. There was a Kingpin that they did that with too. Um, Kingpin, the enemy from Daredevil and Spider-Man. Uh, overall, I like this wave a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of the comics that the characters with these particular appearances are from so there's an element of just really liking them from that perspective um i do think you know for the the characters that were mostly like reuses um like i'm kind of not a big fan of this particular professor xavier look in general uh it's accurate to the character and all but i don't think he's particularly exciting or anything like that this wolverine They've just done a, a lot of really good Wolverines, and this I would consider pretty middle of the road as far as a Wolverine release. I love Wolverine. I love Wolverine toys. I like this, uh, the older Wolverine head that they included, I think is the best feature of this particular Wolverine. Um, because like I said, other than that, he's kind of like just using the standard Wolverine formula as far as the different pieces that they're... Uh, that they're choosing to use for this. You can see he is suitably shorter than the rest uh, as Wolverine is a short guy overall. Um, a lot of bonuses, a lot of accessories, way more hands than anybody actually needs. You just gotta admit it to yourself, collectors. This is more hands than what you need. Um, but overall, yeah, I'm a big, big fan of this. Like I said, I'm a big fan of X-Men. I don't think I did a particularly great job as far as explaining why the current run of X-Men is so interesting, but it is a lot of fun. Uh, I hope that we get that rumored second wave of characters from this particular line of comics because they've had a ton of really interesting and well-designed characters in this particular run of X-Men, and so it'd be great to see some of those designs made into action figures. Um, I'm, I'm running out of space to display my X-Men, so I'm going to need to figure something out or get some more shelves or buy another house. I mean, there's a lot of options, but like I said, uh, we opened seven toys, eight if you include the Tri-Sentinel. That's, uh, that's a lot of opening toys. 
Um, yikes. Buying another house? Or what? Um, but that being said, I think that brings us to a close for today. Um, love X-Men. Uh, this is a nice, nice wave. I'm glad to see that they're doing comic design so soon after their debut. And again, I do hope that they'll make more from this current run of X-Men. Uh, if I don't see you before then, have a very happy Easter. Thank you, everybody, who tuned in uh, to watch me open some X-Men toys. Um, today is, uh, I, I think today is Trans Day of Visibility, so shout out to all of my friends and family members who are trans. I support and love all of you. Thank you all. See you next time. Bye.